China has launched a space lab for astronauts, signaling a new era in its race to explore outer space. With the Tiangong-2 Space Laboratory, China is making leaps towards space research and exploration. CCTV's Guan Yang watched the launch and sent us this report. Twenty-four years after the country launched its manned space program, this is what it has achieved. The Long March 2F rocket with Tiangong-2 on board ignites the sky above the Gobi Desert. This is it. After years of dedication, China's second space lab is now being sent into orbit. It is actually referred to as China's first real space laboratory. With that, a new chapter in China's manned space program has been opened. I am so excited. Come on, China. Uh, I've seen the takeoffs many times, so for tonight's launch, I've watched it from different angles. It was breathtaking. The new space lab will be used to conduct various experiments in the field of aerospace medicine, space science and on-orbit maintenance. It is capable of receiving manned spacecraft and a cargo ship for propellant resupply, most importantly to test the water for China's future space program. The living quarters of the new space lab have been improved for mid-term on-orbit stays. Two astronauts can stay there for 30 days without getting resupply. Since launching its first manned space station in 2003, China staged a spacewalk, landed a rover on the moon and launched a demo space station Tiangong-1 in 2011. Today, the launch of Tiangong-2 space lab helps to realizing the Chinese dream in space exploration. Guanyang CCTV, Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center. Joining us now to discuss China's space exploration from Beijing, Yang Yuguang is a professor at the China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation. From Texas, Leroy Chow is a retired NASA astronaut and former International Space Station commander. With us in the studio, Victoria Sampson is the Washington director of the Secure World Foundation, which promotes sustainable space exploration. And via Skype from Dublin, Lewis Brennan is a professor of business at Trinity College and author of the book, The Business of Space. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Yang Yuguang, let me start with you in Beijing. So China has launched this space laboratory, that um, launch taking place, as we just reported, on Thursday. Why is this launch so important to China's space exploration program? Uh, well, you know that the China's manned space program has a three-step strategy. The first step is to uh, master the basic, basic technologies for men in space. And the second step to have a space laboratory in space and uh, have short-term duration in space. And third step will establish its uh, space station. We have we have accomplished the uh, Tiangong-1 and the Shenzhou-8, 9, and 10 mission. With these missions, we have mastered the rendezvous and dock, uh, docking technology, which is very uh, critical and essential uh, for the future construction of the space station. And this uh, Tiangong-2, together with the Shenzhou-11 and the Tianzhou-1 uh, cargo ship, will form the final stage of the second step. So uh, the, the launch of Tiangong-2 will be a very critical and very important step for this uh, stage. So uh, if it cannot be successful, uh, the Shenzhou-11 sh uh, spaceship and the Tianzhou-1 target uh, cargo ship will lose its target. Uh, so uh, the, uh, t t uh, the Tiangong-2 uh, laboratory will be very important. And after the launch, we will have also many critical steps uh, necessary for the future experiment. For instance, yesterday we have just performed the two uh, orbit maneuvers and changed the uh, orbit from elliptical, uh, elliptical one to a circular one, and also raised its altitude. This is also very important for the future uh, rendezvous and docking with Shenzhou 11 spaceship. And with this uh, pre preparation works, uh, we will test the midterm stay of astronauts in space uh, for you see in the future. Uh, the astronauts will st stay longer in the its space station. And also, we will uh, next year test the refueling technology, which is also very critical for the uh, 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 establishment of the future space station. Okay, Leroy, we've got a lot of information there on what this laboratory is doing right now, the fact that its orbit has changed from an elliptical one to a circular one. 
You, the man who's been in space, take us to the mechanics of what happens in a launch like this. So we have the lab that's going up, but the astronauts that are going to be living in that lab only go up next month. Uh, then what happens? Right, so the crew will launch next month. They'll go and rendezvous and dock to Tiangong 2, uh, much the same way that the crews that went to Tiangong 1 demonstrated the, the capability. And the difference is this time this crew is going to live for 30 days on the station, which is a little over twice as long as the previous uh, longest crew of uh, uh, the Chinese Tiangong 1 station. They'll be doing a number of different tests, as we heard, including, I'm sure, uh, proofing out a new life support system. Uh, it's later next year, they'll be, they'll be testing out refueling capability with their uh, Tenjo uh, resupply ship and refueling ship. And so uh, this is really a nice measured step the next step along the way, if you will, of advancing their space operations capability. Uh, in 2006, I was the first American invited to the Astronaut Center of China. And in addition to getting to meet Yang Liwei and Fei Junlong and some of the other astronauts, uh, I got to tour the center and look at the technology. And I was pretty impressed with what I saw. But what I recognize is that they, they lack operational experience. And so they're very methodically in a stepwise fashion gaining that experience as they move towards their actual space station, you know, their, their uh, more permanently crewed space station uh, scheduled for launch, the first element in 2018. But Leroy, in terms of what the space vehicles are doing right now, uh, like the International Space Station, this laboratory is built over time piece by piece, is it? That's correct, and so it's uh, it's a smaller going to be a smaller station than the ISS. Uh, it's going to be a bit simpler. The uh, the construction phase it looks like it'll be automatic docking of of two additional modules to the core module that's going to be launched in 2018. And actually, that's it's not uh, a criticism at all because actually. Uh, we demonstrated the capability to do a very complex space structure in building the ISS, and it is by far the most complex and audacious facility that's ever been conceived and executed and now operated. But really, there's an argument to be made for smaller, more simple stations that maybe require a little bit less maintenance and could possibly end up doing a higher percentage of its time using it for utilization, actually doing the experiment research operations. Uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit analogous to having a big house here on Earth or a smaller one. You know, the smaller one generally uh, takes a little less maintenance and, and maybe you've got more time to do other things. Okay, let's bring in Lewis from uh, Dublin. And Lewis, China's space program has made great strides in a very short space of time, but how does it compare internationally with uh, the whole array of space programs that we see financed by other countries. Um, over the past several decades has been quite impressive. Um, and of course, um, its ambition, uh, as you've indicated, um, is, is quite great. Um, however, relative to the US space program in terms of uh, the amount of expenditure involved of uh, the U.S. space program is still several multiples uh, of the China uh, space program. But interestingly, um, the activity that's going on in terms of launches on satellites from China, um, well, well, not at the same level as that in the case of the U.S., is still very impressive by, when one compares the relative expenditures by the two countries. So um, I, I would uh, argue that the productivity of China's space program um, is quite signific significant relative to the U.S. Um, it still as well lags behind in terms of, of uh, expenditure and, and in terms of um, uh, state of development, the European Space Agency's uh, space program. But looking ahead, um, I, I would expect, I mean, we said in our book, The Business of Space, that China will uh, be a major space player into the future. And um, all the steps that it's taken, very deliberate, very graduated, very measured, um, all indicate uh, that into the future, China will indeed be a major uh, player in space um, and eventually um, uh, on a par with, with the other uh, major players in space. All right. And Victoria, when we look at a program like this, it's an ambitious program. What are the kinds of challenges that the Chinese would face? Well, space is tricky. <laughs> it is rocket science for a reason. And so as we saw even last week when the United States here in SpaceX had a rocket blow up, there are always going to be some issues to work out with the technological issues. 
But in addition to that, there's the political ramifications and diplomatic concerns about what China plans to do with the space capabilities. There are some within the United States that are very, shall we say, leery about what China intends to do. They worry that perhaps they're trying not just to become a major space power, but to become a pure competitor or to overcome the United States in a domain that the U.S. national security community is traditionally seen as theirs to work in alone. And um, so that's going to be something that definitely we need to work through through international discussions. So these programs have what, a security application, a military application? Uh, the human space flight, no, but mm -hmm. China has tested what has been considered to be an anti-satellite capability. Right. At least five times they've put what they said was a science experiment of a geostationary orbit um, in 2013, and um, that was a real wake-up call for a lot of people who thought the U.S. early warning satellites would be out of reach of anything China had to put up there. Uh, Yang Yuguang, what do you make of those concerns that uh, Victoria has been talking about here? Uh, well, uh, you see that uh, we China developed the its uh, manned space program due to its own requirement, not competitor with any other countries. And also, you see, uh, yes, the space technology has still use. Uh, this is because the space technology comes from the early stage of the World War II. And uh, during the moon race and the, uh, uh, the early stage space station, they do have some military uh, purposes of this station. But in recent years, it proved that the military uh, purposes uh, in the manned space program is not very efficient, not very effective. So uh, mainly in recent years, the manned space program are purely for scientific research goal. And also, uh, China developed its uh, space program, especially the manned space program, and deep, uh, deep, uh, deep space uh, exploration program, uh, just for the benefit of the whole uh, whole human being and also the national economy to promote the development of technologies. So, Yang Yuguang, we have Tiangong-2. It's going to conduct several experiments uh, in space. What can you tell us about these experiments, and what do the Chinese hope to learn from them? Well, there will be many interesting experiments. For instance, as I mentioned, that uh, the, uh, the future uh, astronauts will stay in space station for every uh, predict expedition team will stay there for half a year, very similar to that in the, uh, in the ISS. So uh, to master this technology, we must find what kind of problems can we meet. So this time, we will let the astronauts to stay there for four months uh, in the Tiangong-2 space laboratory. And uh, with this uh, midterm uh, period, we will have plenty of chances to perform many uh, experiments uh, uh, the in, in, uh, during the uh, 80 days. Uh, they will perform 14 experiments on board the Tiang uh, Tiangong-2. Uh, one of them is the super cold atomic clock, which is a very accurate clock, which is even uh, much better than the tra traditional atomic clocks uh, used on the Beidou navigation satellites. So if this, uh, this experiment will be successful, uh, the navigation system will have higher performance. I hope this can be successful. And also, uh, you know that China has launched the uh, Mozi or Mises uh, quantum science experimental satellites last month. Uh, this time, China will also have the quantum uh, encryption key distribution experiment on board the Tiangong-2. So this will be more uh, practical uh, technology in the future. I believe it will also benefit the whole world. And besides that, right. we also have some uh, cooperation experiments with other countries, such as the uh, gamma ray burst uh, experiment with ESA, and also some kind of uh, space cardiology uh, study uh, with other countries. Leroy, let's take a listen to what Wu Ping of the China Manned Space Engineering Office had to say about the country's space program. Let's watch this. This will be China's longest manned space flight. Shenzhou 11 is our sixth manned space flight. Our astronauts will travel on Shenzhou 11 to dock with the Tiangong 2 space lab. They will stay on Tiangong 2 for 30 days. If we add the three days travel, the total time in space will be 33 days, up from the 15 days of the Shenzhou 10 mission. So this will be the longest manned space flight in China's history. So Leroy, these astronauts will spend 33 days in space. You've been a space commander on the International Space Station. What can these astronauts expect during these uh, 33 days? Well, 33 days is going to be a lot different than, you know, just a one-week or even a two-week trip. Uh, what they'll find after, uh, after about the, you know, close to the fourth week 
is uh, your body will start to kind of equilibrate. You know, it'll start to adapt more fully to the weightless environment. So I think what they'll measure, what they'll find from their experiments is that uh, it'll be a little bit different than what they've found in their earlier flights, which were much shorter. So the, uh, the astronauts will have more of a chance to adapt both physiologically as well as mentally. They'll kind of settle more into a routine. You know, the analogy of the earlier flights would be like a shuttle mission, a one or a two week shuttle mission. Uh, those always felt like a sprint to me. You know, you get up there, you're trained, you've, you, every minute counts and you're, you're working pretty hard. And then it seems like it's almost over before it began. But in, on a station flight, right around a month, you start kind of settling into a routine. So just as they start getting into that routine, uh, unfortunately for them, I guess they'll be coming back to Earth. But I, and of course, China's going to be flying uh, longer missions as well, uh, I would think, on Tiangong 2. And then eventually, of course, as they build their and operate their, their, other, their newer and bigger space station. Okay, I want to talk about the business of space, but we are going to have to take a break right now. Coming up, what's the next phase of China's space exploration? Stay with us, you're watching The Heat.